Let's turn to God's word. We're going to turn to Romans. Uh, We've been thinking, haven't we, about the best news ever. And we've begun to see the best news ever. We spent weeks thinking about the worst news ever. And then we've begun to see the best news ever. Uh, And then we get to Romans chapter 4. And I'm going to read uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 25, the whole chapter. Children, you might want to listen out for a main character whose name begins with A. Okay, there we go. Uh, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And, when, and when, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Well, please, if you have a Bible, do turn to that passage we had uh, earlier, Romans chapter 4. And our our, uh, passage today is going to ask us uh, three questions. But you know there's different kinds of questions, aren't there? There's the, where were you at 2 a.m. on the 14th of October? Well, officer, (laughs) there's that kind of question, interrogation type question. Then there's a kind of irritating question. Have you got a few minutes to fill in this questionnaire? And you're, oh, no, not one, you know, that kind of question. But then there's a kind of question where you go, can I afford this? Hmm, does this fit me? Uh, Where should we go on holiday? I wonder what happens when we die. Those kind of personal question aren't they they're not someone asking you a question they're certainly not in an aggressive kind of way but they're kind of questions you're like hmm 
And this passage is going to give us three of those kind of personal questions that you'd ask yourself having listened to what the man has said so far. So we're going to look at these questions. Can we put the first one up, please? Right, the first one is this. Is the, is the good news newfangled and made up? As, you, as we listen to this Christian message, you would ask yourself, hmm, I don't know, it's all a bit new, and is it just made up? That's what the author's answering in that first little section. What shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? What, why does he go back to Abraham? Why, why is that? Well, because people are going, hold on a minute. Christianity feels like a new kid on the block. And I'm not so sure. Hmm. Is this real? Is this just made up? Now, you know what it's like with new stuff. I don't know what you're like with new stuff. Uh, if you can kind of imagine a curve like that. On this end is the people who love new stuff. And on this end are the people who, I am definitely not going to do that. And in the middle, most of us, like, oh, I'm not sure, not sure. Now, as you get older... You go from this end, I like new stuff. As you get older, you're in that, you gradually go this way. <laughs> I've discovered this because my daughter got me to, uh, she looked at my phone, and um, I mustn't use too much time on the illustration because the countdown clock's going. And she said, oh, Dad, you know, you're with, you're with Voda. What are you doing with Vodafone? I mean, how much are you paying per month? And I said, oh, I'm paying this much per month. Oh, you, don't need to be, you, need, you need to be with Voxy. Oh, I've never heard of them. No, I've never done it. And she signed me up. And I'm now paying two lots of mobile money because I don't know how to cancel Vodafone. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, and that's me, you see. As, it, as new things come, she's wide open and I'm like, oh, I haven't got a clue. Do you know, are, you, are you like that? So here's something new. Now, it doesn't, Christianity doesn't seem new now, but it was then compared to, compared to the Jewish religion, Jewish faith, which a lot of people who were reading this, were aware of, or even compared to the Greek and the Roman gods, or even the kind of vague spiritual mysticism that's been around for millennia. And even now, although people say, oh, Christian England, you know, look, there are churches and, you know, spires everywhere. As soon as you start talking about what this man has been talking about, people go, hold on a minute. I remember when I was a first Christian, um, the, the phrase born again Christian, have you come across that born again Christian? And there's a lot of people in England thought, oh, born again is, oh, those Americans. Oh, God, here we are, we go on the sales bit. It, it, it is new. Born again is new. And you're like, no, Jesus talked about being born again. But it sounded new to British ears. So it's like, oh, hold on a minute. We don't want this new stuff. We're, we are, you know, we're here in England. We, we don't need all this new born again stuff. A, 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 a few centuries ago, you heard of the Methodism? Have you come across the Methodist church? Well, the, the guys that helped start that, a man called John Wesley and his brother Charles and a man called George Whitfield, when they first started speaking the Christian message of being right with God, getting a peace with God, a new relationship with God, it, it, people said, oh, all this new stuff, all this new stuff. And this man is describing getting right with God. And you might go, oh, I, I, look, I, I don't mind Christianity, but I don't want this. You go, no, this is Christianity, but is it new? Is it made up? Is it newfangled? We're a bit suspicious. So he says, well, let me tell you. Now, you know what product endorsement is, don't you? Product endorsement. You've got a, a celebrity says, you know, go on and buy it. Now, if you go, I was on Classic FM on the way here, and uh, Stephen Fry flogs Sainsbury's stuff, basically. Okay, they, Stephen Fry does all the makeovers for Sainsbury's, you know, wine and food and all the rest of it. He endorses the product. I don't happen to listen to that much. I, you know, I just, I, I don't, just because you're Stephen Fry, I don't rush out to Sainsbury's. But you know, but, but you know how products endorsed. Well, Paul says, look, let's go back to something really important in the history of the Bible story. Let's go back to Abraham, our forefather. In one sense, the one for whom it all started. What did he find? Well, he found the same message as I'm telling you now. Verse 2. If Abraham was justified, that is, put right with God, declared innocent in God's sight by what he did, by something he achieved, by something he was, then he would be able to boast about it. 
I got three A stars. I passed my driving test first time. Oh, nobody else? <laughs> but you know what it is? Human beings can't help. It was great. We boast, even about spaghetti bolognese. Mine. But he says, no, Abraham wasn't put right with God by what he did. He was put right by, with God by trusting God. And he explains what that's all about in verse 4. This is not newfangled. This is the message from right from the beginning. Right from the very beginning of the Bible, right through to his time then and our time now. People are put right with God the same way. They are justified not by works, but by faith in Jesus. Verse 4, to the one who works, if you work, your wages is what you're owed. It's what you deserve. It's not a gift, is it? You know at, at, that with a tax man. If, if somebody gives you some money, that's a very different taxable thing than if you've earned it. If you've earned it, you've got to pay tax on it. We just had a case this week, didn't we? Uh, for um, 400 million. Bernie Eccleston didn't declare. 400 million. Now, if the tax amount ever comes after you for Fiverr, you say, why don't you go after Bernie Eccleston for 400 million? He owed because he didn't. But to the one who trusts God, who, who gives you right standing, the one who does not work, does not rely on what I've done or who I am, where I've been, what I've achieved, but I rely completely on God. And then there's an astonishing phrase. Verse 5, you trust, you rely on God to declare you not guilty when you absolutely are. Got that? Justifies the ungodly. The word justifies a law court word. Is what happens at the end of a trial. Is the defendant guilty or not guilty? And the judge pronounces. You're either guilty and condemned, sentenced, or you're acquitted and set free, justified. It's a law court word. And this is the astonishing. God, who is a fair judge, acquits the manifestly guilty. Now, that's, just think about that for a moment. Uh, was it just this last week? I didn't see it, but I saw it advertised. There was Steve Coogan did a program about Jimmy Savile. Did you see it advertised? I didn't watch the program. But uh, by all accounts, it was uh, incredibly lifelike and chilling. Now, you know the sad thing about, <laughs> in, in, in many ways, tragic beyond all telling, but Jimmy Savile in his life never was brought to justice because his crimes came out after he died. But you imagine if those crimes had been known about and come into the law court and it, it was all laid out before the judge. This most horrendous evil. It's just like unspeakable. And the, and the judge at the end says, well, you know, Mr. Savile, I used to like Jim will fix it. I'll let you off. I mean, you can't do that. You, you can't just let somebody off because you like them. You, you, you've, got to, you've got to do what's fair and right. And he's guilty and he knows it. And he's even said so. You've got to find him guilty. How can God justify their ungod? Justify their ungod? How can he? He said, go free. The, the ungodly, the people who've got their fist up against him. How, how does that happen? Well, we're told their faith is credited as righteousness. Their faith is credited as righteous. Now that is shorthand. There's a lot of thinking going on here. What he means is this. It's like this. Uh, my, my, my daughter got married last year, and um, yeah, you know when, it's, it's fantastic, and we, but I don't like shopping, and oh God, I've got to get a suit, and oh, crumbs, and you know, wife's got to get an outfit, oh, it's going to take ages. And, and then she said, Dad, all you've got to do is turn up to next at 11 o'clock on Tuesday because your suit is being provided. Your suit's being provided. It's being given you. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go through loads of shop. It's, we've already decided this is the color, this is the size, this is the style. It's being provided. 
Now what Paul is saying is here is your righteousness, your standing with God is being gifted to you. It's being provided for you. Believe that. And I did believe it. I turned up to next and I got the nice blue suit and the rest of it. I, I acted on the promise. Dad, We've already got it sorted, just turn up to next. And I did, and I got the suit, and I looked great, and I enjoyed this wedding. It's provided righteousness with God. What happens is this, God credits. Now, you know that's a bean counter word. Sorry if any of you are an accountant. But it's an accountancy word. And you understand this, because it happens every month. What happens every month? You check your bank statement to make sure your pay's gone in. <laughs> We're safe for another month. And you, you look at your bank statement and you go, I've been, cr my way, uh, it's there. The money's in the bank account. At the moment, I'm the beneficiary of the government crediting to me my pension every month. It's great. They just, it's in. Whew, Jenny, we can now go shopping. You know that kind of thing? The money's in the bank. You live in the light of it. It's credited to your account. The opposite of that is, uh-oh, we're overdrawn and over. Oh, now we're in serious debt. Oh my goodness, we're never going to pay our way out of this. Now, we human beings, what are we with God? Well, ultimately, left to ourselves, we would be in unpayable debt. Unpayable debt. It's so deep in debt with God that we, you, you couldn't pay it for eternity. You'd never pay it. Because within our hearts there's a hostility and a rebelliousness against God, keeping them out of our lives. There's a disobedience of what he says we should do and believe and think. How on earth can an ungodly person be declared innocent of all charges before God? Well, the answer is this. God has made a promise. And he says this, trust me, I will take the perfect life that Jesus lived and credit that to your account as if you'd lived it. And trust me, I've taken your evil and I laid it on my only son when he died on the cross. We, we, we're told that later in verse 13. We're told that righteousness comes by faith or through faith. Now, Really important to say this. What God doesn't do is he looks for faith and says, oh, you've got faith. Okay, I'll treat you as a good person because you've got this thing called faith. You give me faith and I'll, I'll treat you as a good... No, no. Faith is simply taking God's promise. that He will take the perfect life of Jesus and put it in my account and take all my evil and laid it as it were, on Jesus, and Jesus took the full, eternal, infinite consequences of the evil I've done. That's what he says towards the end. That's what he means when he says the last verse, when he explains all this righteousness by faith. See this last verse? He was delivered over to death for our sins, was raised to life for our, justi uh, our justification. God, it, God credits righteousness to us not because we're righteous or that faith itself is something meritorious, something worthy. God says, oh, you've got a lot of faith. Oh, that's a really wonderful thing. No, faith is simply like, help. And God says, trust me, I will take Jesus' righteousness and lay it into your account. Every time I look into your account, you're not in unpayable debt. You're in infinitely right standing with me. That's how I see you. So I can now be God, just, fair, and right, and acquit you. Because in my sight, all I can see is this perfect life of Jesus credited to your account. And believe me, I took all your evil and Jesus paid on the cross. He took the judgment that you deserve. He took it all on the cross. Trust me. Abraham looked forward to that. He didn't know all the details of how that would be. But he looked forward and trusted that God would take his evil and lay it on Jesus' shoulders. It was a debt that God was going to pay for him in the future. For us, it's a lot easier. We can look back and say, God has paid the debt on the cross. Jesus paid my debt on the cross. It's a lot easier for us. But it's the same faith. We trust God 
who does what I cannot do. It's not newfangled. It's not made up. And he uses another illustration of David. David says the same thing. David didn't say, I've lived a good life and God has been kind to me because I'm such a nice person. He says, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never account against them. Instead of counting your sin against you, count God counted your sin against Jesus. David said, that's what I believe. That's what I've experienced. God is going to count my sin against the ultimate sin bearer Jesus himself who had no sin so he could take the blame for me now in David and Abraham's day they used to sacrifice animals as a picture but but you know this animals can't serve a human sentence I mean you imagine you did get done for something serious and got sentenced to five years and say it's okay my pet rabbit will take the sentence instead of me no 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 no. it has to be a human to take a human's blame you know this is dads and mums. You get the phone call. They've only just passed their driving test. They just smashed up the car. <sighs> okay, I'll pay. Uh, that's being a dad, actually. Every time the phone goes. If your dad or grown-up kids, you know this, don't you? Every time the phone goes, you have no say into their lifestyle, but ultimate liability for anything that goes wrong. This is how it is, okay? And that's exactly what God the Father does. I could charge you, but I will pay myself. And I'll pay everything. But the mystery of it all is this. I might do that for a child I love, but I'd never do it for an enemy that hates me. But God commends, and going to go on into chapter 5, God commends his love to us in this. While we were still sinners, rebels, Christ died for our sins. Abraham believed that. David believed that. Christianity is not newfangled. It's not just made up. It's the consistent story. This is how everybody gets peace with God, how gets right with God, gets a relationship with God. You trust God who will acquit you, though you're guilty, because he took all your sin in love and laid it on Jesus' shoulders. And Jesus said, I, I, I want that to happen. Please treat me as if I've done their evil so that you could treat them as if they were your beloved son. That's the great mystery. That's the great wonder of the Christian message. And then he goes on in verse 9. And perhaps the next question, please. It's kind of next ponderably. But is this good news for me? It's not, I'm, I'm not religious even if I'm not religious. Now, he's particularly thinking of people who question, like, I'm not Jewish. And there was around at the time, some people going to say, oh, it's all very well to believe in Jesus, but you also need to be truly Jewish. You need to have the great signs of being Jewish, circumcision, and follow the law of Moses, verse 13. And Paul says, well, hold on a minute. When? Did Abraham get peace with God? When did he get into a right relationship with God? When was Abraham declared innocent of all charges? When did God justify Abraham? When did God take righteousness and put it in Abraham's account? Even though Abraham had no righteousness of his own, when did he do it? And he asked that question. Is this only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. It was through faith that God said, you trust me, I will justify you. Under what circumstances? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after but before. It was while he was still far from God. It was why he was irreligious in in Jewish terms. He was irreligious in Jewish terms. You might be saying, well, oh, is this this really for me? I, I, I know that. Question, I, I was brought up a lovely home. My mum and dad, wonderful parents, just wonderful. But we weren't a religious home. I didn't go to church. I don't think we had a Bible. I kind of knew about God and Jesus only through RE at school. I wasn't religious. When somebody says, let's turn to the book of Romans, I'd have gone, what's that? And some of the other names of the New Testament books really weird. It might as well come from Planet Zog, Colossians and Philippians. Like, like, what's all that stuff? And it felt, it was like very in-house. Like if you're brought up in it, fine. If you're outside it, 
it kind of feels all a bit weird if you've got, if you've got a funny handshake in the door. And it's, you know, it's all kind of, when you're not in it, when you're brought up in it, it seems all normal. Paul and Moses and, you know, and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, no, from the outside, I, I haven't got, cl- I'm sorry, I don't know any of these names. I don't know who you mean by the Apostle Paul. What does that word Apostle mean? I haven't got a clue. I, I wasn't religious. And it's a very natural question to feel that Christianity is for those who are already Christians. Who go, who are churched. But I wasn't. But Paul is saying, no. Abraham experienced peace with God before all the religious stuff. It wasn't that that religious stuff wasn't wrong. It wasn't evil or anything like that. But he got peace with God not because of his religiosity. In, in fact, the, the thing that happened, circumcision, was just a sign of what had already happened before. And that gives you hope, doesn't it? So Christianity is not for Christians. Christianity is a message for everybody. The ungodly. That's who it's a message for. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's a message for everybody. Not just for some. The message is that God will treat anybody and everybody who will take him at his promise and acquit them. Can you imagine going into a prison and saying to every prisoner, if you believe me, I've got a, so- a document in my hand and the judge will set you free this afternoon. I mean, imagine doing that to anyone and everybody who will believe me. Well, that's what the Christian message is. However far you may be from God, however disinterested, however evil you know you've been, And the more you ponder it, you know that evil is the plague of every human heart, especially yours. Boasting. Jealousy. Self-absorption. Conceit. Lust. Anger. Rage. Malice. For most human beings, they go, yeah, that was just yesterday or even this morning. Evil is not out there, over there. It's in here. And the message is God will take the life of Jesus and put it into your account if you believe him. And that whole section, he says, before Abraham was religious, before he was Jewish. And then verse 13, and it wasn't through the law of Moses. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise he'd be heir of the world, but simply through God's grace. Verse 14, if you depend on the law, faith means nothing. It means you've earned it. It's deserved. It's coming to you, whatever. No, he says in verse 16, the promise comes by faith that it might be by God's grace, not by human merit. We've just sung it. Not by human endeavor. Not by what I do. Not the labors of my hands. Abraham becomes our father simply because he trusted God and all who trust God will become children of God, right with God. And the third question, the final question, is verse 18 onwards. Can we just put it up, please? So should I trust God to rescue me by Jesus? That would be the, the question, isn't it? It's not newfangled. It's for everyone. You don't have to be religious. It's a message for everyone to trust God's way of putting rebels right with himself. So should I trust God? So in verse 18 onwards, Paul describes what it means to trust God. Now you know the word faith is a slippery word, isn't it? I I mentioned it last Sunday night, if you were here. Faith is a slippery word because it has a kind of range of meanings. I believe that Walker's cheese and onion are the most flavoursome crisp in the whole world. Now that is a point of view. It's an opinion. Okay, Uh, It's quite different from I believe that two add two equals four. I believe that. Well, that's, that's a matter of logic and rationality. I, I believe that we had the Olympic Games in London in 2012 is a statement of fact. You're not saying whether you thought it was a good thing or a bad thing. You're just saying it happened, and it's true. It's a statement of fact. 
And then the kind of, I believe in you, Mr. Surgeon, called Ben Lamb, that you could save my life if you operate and remove my cancerous prostate gland. Over to you, sir. That's a statement of personal commitment and trust, isn't it? Now, what he describes in verse 18 is the kind of faith that Abraham had in God. It, it, what kind of faith was it? Well, it wasn't a personal opinion. I happen to like the God of the Bible. I don't. It's not, it's not a preference thing. It's not an opinion thing. It is, in a way, a statement of logic. Abraham was, had his, this whole era of credit. He could see. Abraham understood this. I can't give God anything. God must give me anything. That, that's logical. I've got nothing good I can offer God. He must, he must if, if he's ever to put me right with himself, God must do it. That's logic, you see. That's, and Abraham understood the logic. God credits me righteousness. Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. God credits me righteousness because he's, he's going to credit my sin to someone else other than me. He's not going to hold me accountable. He's going to hold... And Abraham had a great picture that one day it would be the one and only son. Abraham had to sacrifice his one and only son. Just as he brought down the dagger, God said, stop. You now understand gospel logic. Gospel logic is I take your sin and lay it on a lamb, but not a lamb, but on the son. And God's judgment came on Jesus. Abraham understood that logic. So Christianity, in, in one sense, faith in clear rationality logic. And secondly, it's, it's faith in something factual. Abraham was told he was going to have a son. He believed that God could do something, and the son was born, even though he was as good as dead. He, he didn't waver unbelief. God, you're going to do something in the real world, and I'm going to trust you for it. Now, Abraham had to trust God forward. We look God and trust God backwards. And what is the great gospel fact? Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day. That's the fact that we believe in. Christianity is not just, oh, I hope this will be okay. I'm, you know, I, I hope God will be nice to me. Christianity is based on something God has done out there, a fact. Christ lived, he died, he was buried, but he rose again on the third day. It's a gospel fact. But it's also a personal trust I commit myself to you Abraham committed himself to God he didn't waver he was strengthening his faith he trusted God he's fully persuaded God had power to do what he promised and that's an illustration for us it was credited to him as righteousness verse 22 the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone but for us because God will do the same to us as we trust God for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead and then the explanation here's the gospel logic he was delivered over to death for our sins was raised to life for our justification that's the gospel logic the fact Christ died was buried and rose again the explanation he was died for our sins raised to life for our justification but then comes that personal commitment i now i god say do that for me i rely on you to do that for me it's not enough enough to know about it out there like okay but it's now that time when i go i need this i want this i god would you justify me would you declare me free of all charges would you forgive all my past would you treat me as one of your children I, I commit myself Ooh. Ooh, timer ends I commit myself to you see God has supernaturally intervened in this world now don't be surprised at that we supernaturally intervene all the time see uh, this bunch of keys uh, what would nature do to this bunch of keys well Isaac Newton found that by standing up, sitting under an apple tree didn't he nature would chunk but I can throw him to Rich and he can catch him. Now at that point, Richard acted supernatural. He was a bit slow, but he <laughs> it, was he, it was a rugby catch. You see, see, naturally keys will fall to the ground, but you see, we are made like God. Some of you were here, like we're made in God's image. God is a person. And he can intervene. 
Just like when you do, when somebody says catch, nature would just propel the keys towards you and they would hit you and that would be it. But because you're a person made in God's image, you can make an, in your heart and mind, you make a decision to intervene and you catch. Well, God has intervened in human history. He's come into this world as a human being so that he could have arms to catch us and die for us on the cross. Take the full consequences, unspeakable awfulness of dying for the evil that you and I have done. And he now then says to you as a surgeon would say to a patient, trust me, put your life in my hands. Entrust yourself to me. Put your eternity in my hands. And I believe me, I will never let you down. I will not let you go. You will not find that it was a mistake. Trust me. What an incredible invitation from God that is, isn't it? To say, put yourself in my hands and I will keep you safe forever and ever. But when I was a cancer patient, I knew what the alternative was. It was either trust Mr. Lamb or I'd die. So, however scary it might seem, I trusted Mr. Lamb. But far, far more significantly was that I committed my life to Jesus Christ. I cannot tell you how simple the prayer was in my upstairs bedroom when I was 18 to say, Jesus, will you forgive my sins? Nearly 50 years ago. Simple. Here I am with all my sin. I hand it all over to you. Jesus does everything. And amazingly, God does everything in the gospel. And we just go, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. You mean I am forgiven everything forever and now I can call you father. Yeah, that's, that's how much I love you. Why wouldn't you do that? I mean, why wouldn't you do that? What a crazy thing not to trust God who justifies the ungodly. This is a message for you this morning. You're ungodly, just like I am. And this incredible true and living God says, hand your life over to me and I will keep it safe forever. No wonder this man got excited about the Christian message. And next chapter five, you see, now we've been justified through faith. We've peace with God. We've life with God. Our Christian life begins. And we never ever forget the glory and the wonder of a saviour who loved me, gave himself for me. Maybe this morning is the time when you've been asking yourselves this question. Is Christianity for me? Is this message for me? And the resounding Word from God is, yes, it is. It is just for you. Don't harden your heart, the Bible says. Commit yourself to me this morning. Entrust all your evil to me. I've dealt with it on the cross once and forever. Trust me. I will justify you and make you one of my children. And nothing is going to separate you from my love. It's a Christian message. It's bang up to date. It's for you this morning. Thanks, Rich.